bingo. That's a capital B, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> we're back to 2 o'clock rock, and we're talking about community matters, and we're talking about what do the Tonys mean for Hawaii. But it's just, that's just a kind of a, a place to go segue, right? Right. Eden Lee Murray, professor of theater from HPU, thank you so much for joining us. You are the personification of theater in Hawaii. So <laughs> you are. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> thank you. Certainly for um, something that I love and is very near to my heart at any level, whether I'm teaching it, directing it, performing in it, yeah. watching it. Yeah. What is it about theater that makes you so excited? I think it's the community. It's the idea of being part of something that is way bigger than any one person can do. Even if it's a one-person show, you've got your sound person, you've got your light person, you've got your director, you've got your audience. Everybody, everybody who comes into the theater from whatever capacity comes in with an agreement that they're going to do something together. You know, one of the things I tell my kids, and I know this because I do it, um, when an audience member walks in through the door of a theater, I don't care how old they are chronologically, they're five years old, and they come in trusting you. Trusting and you. And saying, tell me a story. And believing that everybody that they're going to watch from there on has put it all on the line to deliver a story yeah. and take them from A to Z, whatever yeah. happens in yeah. between. Yeah. To me, that's moving. It is moving. I, I remember um, I went to see, um, uh, it was nice work if you could get it. Um, it was a couple of years ago, and it was the last performance. I didn't know that. Nobody in the, in the room knew that. And they announced that at the beginning, and they told us, or rather at the end of the play, oh. they told us that it was the last. And, and it was struck me, it struck everyone, what a completely, you know, um, integrated experience was. Everybody was together. You felt the person next to you. You, you felt him breathing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was the community of that theater was, was just fantastic. It happens in Broadway, it happens. Sure. Um, sometimes these plays don't work out, and I just wanted to tell you that uh, Garrison Keillor, uh, what was his show again? Uh, Prairie Home Companion. Prairie Home Companion, It was yes. a movie by that name. I and I think it was an interesting it. view of art in general, because in art, and I'm excluding present company, there are a lot of crazy people. There are a lot of, you know, innovative people, art people, passionate, they, they're different than the rest you of us. You don't have to exclude present company. Okay, I'm that. No, you that. <laughs> no. I think in order to be um, exciting at what you aspire to do, you have to think outside the box. And that's something, that I, again, I tell my students the sweet meat is out there on the thinnest limb. And you have to dare to put your foot out there, and you yeah. might fall. Yeah. And you have to be ready to fall or fly. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people who do fall. Um, you know, I remember kids in my class. Uh, I grew up in New York. Um, they wanted to go into the theater, and I never heard of any of them again. Yeah. Well, you look at movies. I mean, old movies. Yeah, we do a lot of Turner Classic at home at night, and you look at uh, there'll be a big star, and then there'll be people a long list of credits, and you've never heard of them again. Yeah. You know, and some some went on, and yeah. some and some were good for or were big for a while and then chose to walk away because there's a certain amount of sacrifice that's yeah. involved yeah. in going to that level of professionalism, yeah. whether yeah. it's in the movies, whether it's in the theater. That's yeah. one of the marvelous points about it. I mean, it's a selection of the fittest. It's a bone crusher, too. Yeah. I mean, not everybody succeeds. Yeah. But the ones, the ones who succeed certainly have their gratification, but the other ones who you know, don't succeed, they have gratification, too, even for a moment. You know, 15 minutes of fame. Right. <laughs> well, you think about it, you know, they're the ones who don't make it are the ones who can go to the grocery store without wearing makeup. <laughs> they're the ones whose marriages aren't pulled apart on the daily news or inquiring minds want to know and they plan a bunch of stories about, no. <laughs> Very happy not to be in, running in that crowd. You know, I always thought that lawyers, you know, who go to court and try to convince people of their position, they ought to study theater. My family, the men in my mother's side of the family were lawyers and were trial lawyers. And my mother, who was a very good actress, would say, you know, a trial lawyer is one of the best actors there because yeah. you've got to perform for the jury, you've got to improvise, you've got yeah. to think on your feet, you've got to do your lines, know your homework, have a very strong point of view, and sell your story. And the, the good, the guys who are good at it, and girls, 
they really love it. They love to be in front of a jury. Yeah. I mean, it's an, ex an exhilarating experience to be in front of a jury. It's not just that they're being entertained, which they are. It's that you're trying to make them, have them make a political decision in your favor. And you're going to use every technique you can to convince them. It's one of the most interesting processes in our culture, for sure. Well, try, you know what? If I can plant something here. There is a really interesting jury story in a new play that's about to open up at the end of this summer called The Last Days of Judas Iscariot. Mm. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Uh, Stephen Grigis. Yeah. It's the trial of Judas, who is, the, the play is set in purgatory. Yeah. The two lawyers, the defense attorney is somebody who lives in purgatory, <laughs> who is an Irish, she's a split between an Irish father and a gypsy mother, and the prosecutor is El Fayumi, who's this really slick Arab gentleman, and they put on this trial with Judas, who's practically catatonic, his life in the balance, and it's all about, um, it's all about choice, free will, forgiveness, um, transcend transcendence. Uh, it's hilariously funny. It is edgy as can be, F-bombs flying all over the place, but ultimately it goes from being hilariously funny to being deeply moving, and that's going to be at um, Lab Theater, at the Lab Theater Ken at, uh, Kennedy. A August 18th through September 3rd. I highly recommend. Yours truly does it turn as Mother Teresa. <laughs> well, you know, but what you, 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 you make the point that um, it touches every part of our lives. Okay. And what we get from the media, what we get from even from our education is not complete because the human condition is, um, it's, it's needs to be studied all the time from inside, from outside. Ideas have to be thrown at us. We have to integrate this. Um, and our lives are not complete unless we have, you know, that special crucible of the theater where anything goes, yeah. anything goes. And the beauty for the audience is you're sitting in the dark and you're watching the trial. I mean, you are, in a sense, the jury, and you're watching the trial play out on stage, and then you get to, if the playwright is successful, you walk out with what they want you to think. In the Greek days, it was the catharsis that purge the ill of whatever society yeah. was dealing I'd love to know what kind of catharsis we need right now, yeah. given what's operating. What's going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think art will follow that. I think there'll be a lot of art around what's happening in Washington. We're only beginning, yeah. um, and you know, it's too serious uh, not to be art. <laughs> it must be. We need art on this. We need interpretation of it, right. you know, to connect it up in our human condition. So why did you get into this? You mentioned your mother was an actress. Was yeah. That? What does that mean to your decision? Uh, it wasn't really a decision made. Um, I grew up, when I was really, really little, I, my mom did, uh, she, she'd had her time in New York. She was at the American Academy of Dramatic Art and then was with a wonderful national radio company and was working with a cadre of actors who were going to go with television when it broke nationally, right, commercially. Then came World War II, and that put the kibosh on that. So she was one of the women who went down to Washington and was in a force and went back from Washington, New York, uh, worked with the Rockefellers, at which point, long about 46, her father said, I think it's time you came home and got married, and that's, that's <laughs> to Kansas City, and that's what young women did when their fathers said, come home, they went. So she came home, she was married to my dad, who she'd grown up with within about six months, and. Never did professional theater again, but she never was very far from it. So I remember being tucked under her arm when she was part of a community theater. We'll talk about community theater yeah. in a minute, if you like. Um, community children's theater. And they trooped from school to school. And I would sit backstage and watch as these women that I'd watched get dressed upstairs, one of them three months pregnant, she had a little baby bump, all that business, and, but now she was somebody else. And they went down on stage, and the curtain opened, and the light hit them, and they became someone else. That's my mom. <laughs> That's not my mom. <laughs> That's Gutenberg. <laughs> That's the little Chinese boy who says Rick T. Shin too to make the tree bear fruit. I mean, my mom is making magic on stage, and I couldn't wait to see her afterwards in makeup, in costume. My sister wouldn't have anything to do with her really? until she washed and changed. <laughs> it's so funny. So, but but I just I remember one of after I learned how to read, one of the first things I remember doing is holding a script for Midsummer Night's Dream when my mom was taking over the role of Nick Bottom, and she had to have somebody prompt her with lines. So I mean. I just never thought I would do anything How else. do you do that? I, what, I mean, line? Aside from the lawyer experience, you know, which I can understand, I do not understand how people can put, a, put the garb of another character on top of themselves. Is that character living in any way? 
You know, it's different for every person who's in theater, I think. Uh, I, love, I love the feeling of sort of creating a conduit for another being to come in and try and understand you how they You get possessed think. somehow. I think that's a good way to put it, yeah. because you want to leave yourself off stage. You want to let that other character, you want to create um, a home for them. You want to have your body assume their body. You want to... Um, their voice, their their reactions, which is really interesting. How do you how do you step away and let somebody else react to what's being said to them? Yeah, yeah. It's magic, I think. It is magic, you know? and and what's uh, I mean, really, we must spend a moment just on differentiating how it is to act in the movies and how it is to act in the in the in the, in the theater. And I remember seeing, I was so surprised at this, I, I, an audition of a, a number of women who were auditioning for a part. Screen testing. Hmm? Screen testing for a film or for. For a film. Okay. For film and it struck me how how quiet their voices were because they were talking conversational in an intimate fashion and it's very hard to make a play that that, that carries with soft voices and intimate intimate uh, engagements uh, and the play you're really talking to the audience and whether you have a microphone or not you got to belt it out they got to hear what you're saying hear what you're thinking it's a different projection entirely don't right. you think right i think it's um Creating a character, analyzing a text, living someone else's life, it's the same whether you're film or live. Uh, I think it's a degree of projection, you just said it. Um, in the theater, you have the thought, but it's not enough. It's not enough to have the thought. You have to get it across to the back of the house. A friend of mine who was in my MFA program, a guy who was doing the speech, the Shakespeare speech, it winds up with heavy is the head that wears the crown. <laughs> and he was sitting on stage in the class and doing the speech, and the teacher was somewhere out in the house. He goes, I can't hear you, Buckner, start again. So he began the speech, and he was, blah, 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 he's talking about a nightmare, and it's very intimate. And the <laughs> teacher stopped him, I can't hear you, Buckner, start again. And he did it three or four times. And finally, my friend just said, Gavin, if I'm loud, I don't feel it. And he goes, I don't give a f whether you feel it or not. I can't bloody hear you. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, right? There so, And the thing is, with movies, and it's there's some actors who can go back and forth, because it's the same process. You have to create the person who has the thought. In yeah. movies, if you've got the microphone just off, um, just off, what do you call it, shot, yeah. You don't have to speak very loudly, as well. No. You shouldn't, because then right. it sounds really forced and fake. Right. You have um, the cameras like right here or under your nose, so all you have to do is think something, and it's there. If you do too much, then it's like it's overacting. It's overacting, and yeah. it's really. But on the stage, overacting may be necessary. Well, it has to come from a place of truth. Yeah. If it comes from truth, and you're just trying to get it out there, it's it'll work. And being being private and small doesn't work on stage. Well, I told you that when I saw the Tonys to the, uh, last Sunday, to the extent that I, you know, could appreciate them and, and was willing to spend the time watching all of that, um, I felt that there was a there was a, a blending. It showed you the line. It showed you maybe the connection between movies and and with Hollywood and, and Broadway. Mm -hmm. I prefer Broadway, if you want to know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I was struck with how the, the two are sort of inextricably intertwined now. They're not as separate as they used to be. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with that, but that, that was one of the takeaways that I had in general. And I I think that Hollywood is slicker than Broadway, and I, I, I want Broadway to be more from the heart. Right. And I don't want it to be slick. Well, when it, I thought, for example, the best television was watching Kevin Spacey do Johnny Carson, and the camera was right there, and he was doing TV level work, right? And he yeah. was brilliant. Did you, were you, did you yeah. watch? I saw that, okay. Yeah. Then, for a lot of the big numbers, and given that the audience accepts the fact that they're watching a musical, they're, they don't expect the intimacy of television. And the camera was back for, for, for the big picture for the musical numbers. Occasionally they do close up, but it was with the understanding that the actor you're watching is projecting out there, as opposed to talking to you, the camera, singing, really, which would have come across as very fake and false. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But I dare you to make Bette Midler camera size small. Although no. she can do all she can do films, right? I do free association with her and I always think of the same thing. I air. 
She was born and raised in Iowa. Right, you know. right, 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 right. She's a local girl. Well, and she did, quite she amazing. did Disney films. She was the Witches of Eastwick. Did you see that? She was hilarious. But somehow they got her to where it was, you know, she's doing over the pot like that. She's not projecting to a whole theater because she doesn't need to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love, can I do a Bette Midler story? One of my favorite, favorite stories ever by the guy who wrote a book called Audition, uh, Michael somebody. And Bette Midler couldn't get, she was not, she was not a type, a, a, a Palmolive, sell the soap girl, a commercial girl. She couldn't get hired for Dog Catcher. And she went to this Michael, I can think of his name in a minute, to him, who was also her teacher, in addition to this writer of an audition book, Shirtleff, Michael Shirtleff. And she said, that I'm done, I'm, I'm beaten, I'm, I'm going home, my tail between my legs. And he goes, wait, what is the thing that you want most to do here? And she said, I want to sing for people who get me. He said, figure out a way to make that happen once so that you have tasted success in New York, right? The Baths. She goes and she does her act for The Baths, Barry Manilow playing piano, and the rest is history. The rest is history. There's one line that I'll never forget. It was in one of her movies. Uh, she en endeared herself to me forever. She was playing the role of some egotistical, crazy person, you know, wild, wild woman, you know, exuberant beyond description. And uh, she said, she said to the character opposite her, she said, "But enough about me." Enough about me. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about how you feel about me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't deliver it the way she did. No. But, no. but that, was, that was really a high point. She's a brilliant. I loved it on the. I loved it. We were talking earlier. I loved it when she's giving her. She wins Best Actress. And apparently, just that Hello Dolly she does is showstopper. It's a great play to begin with. Right, right. And then I was reading something in The New Yorker about how she had a coughing fit on stage one night, and somebody, one of the characters, runs off stage and in character breaks brings her a glass of water, she drinks it, and then she does this thing, and she falls down on the stage, and from the back, from the stage, from the floor, she says something. It's a brilliant ad lib, and the audience came to their feet for her, right? So then she's winning the best actress on Broadway, top of the top, and she's giving her thank you speech, and she's acknowledging the play, and the people in the play, and the music begins to play, and she just kept on talking, and the music kept playing, and she got a little bit louder, and the music kept playing, and they ran out of music, and she had the she last kept word. <laughs> I, they use the music to shut people down, yeah. Not <laughs> that middle, no, no, no. <laughs> no. Well, it was really interesting to watch it, and it was a great confirmation. It made you want to go to Broadway right now. Somebody told me that John Rampage uh, in um, in uh, the, what, the theater, uh, the Ruger Theater there, Diamond Head Diamond Theater, Head, right? takes a trip every year. He takes the kids. Of yeah. Did you tell me that? Somebody told me that. He takes it. Well, the shooting stars. There's a trip every year that gets out there to get the kids who are themselves. And this is what we were going to talk about community theater and stuff. I don't know where we are time-wise. But um, the Diamond Head shooting stars um, have sent a number of kids on to New York. Um, it's, it's a chance. So he, the, he does his best to expose them to what's out there professionally and they do their training and they get as far as they can get here and I think you asked what the Tonys mean for those kids the Tonys and Broadway are Mecca you know so they see what the best of the best can yeah. be can do yeah and um, what what John and Diamond Head and it's billed as the Broadway of the Pacific um, he brings as much as possible that kind of scale of musical theater. He'll bring um, artists who have either been in productions or assisted on productions, he'll bring them in to either direct or be in or both at Diamond Head, and it gives the kids a portal into what they could yeah, do if they right, stay with it. Right. It also gives the people who have no ambition to go further professionally a chance to have a taste of what that is. Yeah. And that's important too. Yeah, and it gives guys like me the opportunity to connect a little more with Broadway. Yeah. Let's, let's take a short break. Okay. Eden Lee Murray, she's a professor of theater at HPU. We're talking about uh, do the Tony, what do the Tonys mean for Hawaii? We're going to get to that, the topic question, you know, the, the essential question right after this break. Tim Apichaw, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apichaw. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I'm the host of Power 
up Hawaii, which you can see live from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to politicians to regulators to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. We're back. We couldn't, we couldn't wait to get back. There's so much more to discuss. We'll never finish this, Eden Lee. <laughs> so let's talk about, you know, let's talk about how the Tonys, what the Tonys mean for Hawaii. Because, you know, you, you, when you go and you sit and you rub elbows with the guy next to you and you, and you feel that magic in the theater where everybody is sort of coming together as one, as an audience who is completely, which is completely engrossed in the action on stage. I mean, it's, it's a special experience. It's hard to repeat that. It's hard to do that. You've got to be excellent. And you have so many people, like in the Prairie Home Companion, who are a little crazy, right. who, who have to collaborate, and sometimes they don't do it very well, to, to get there and make that program, make that show. It's one of the most exciting, most fantastic experiences in, in human conduct, I think. But the problem is, it's in Broadway. It's in the crucible in Broadway. It's very hard to do it outside of Broadway. Mm -hmm. And that's a study that you make. That's a, a, a goal that you have, to try to get a crucible going here. Mm -hmm. How do you do that, and how successful have we been? Well, I think we've been very successful. I think um, I'm very proud of what the conglomerate of community theaters is able to do. I think uh, and it runs the gamut of performance being the most important thing, which I think Diamond Head and Manoa Valley, they take stories that are not new necessarily, but they tell them again. Um, they give actors, young, old, community, whatever, a chance to be part of the experience of carrying a story that they know works forward, right, mm -hmm. of learning the dance numbers and being able to perform it five, six, seven, eight, go. Um, <laughs> We're not going to do that today, though. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, um, and then you have a theater like Tag, which is a tiny little theater down there in um, Dole. The Canada, Actors right? Group. The Dole Actors Group, group. right, yeah. Brad, Brad Powell's Theater. And they are more, it's interesting because you have, um, you're juggling performance values versus ideas. And I think TAG, TAG is kind of the off-off Broadway here, and they take the newest plays, the edgiest plays, the plays from that... Broadway, well, from no, off Broadway. No, not, not necessarily oh, any. Oh, from here. So, well, they're just new plays. Whatever. And they do them. Um, they just did a wonderful play, and I can't remember the name of it, alas, but a really edgy exploration of ideas play. Um, Kumu does that for local playwrights and Hawaiian issues. Um, and they do it in a very theatrical fashion. They don't do it like for a Hamilton or where you have to, as a playgoer, shell out upwards of $1,000 to see the final performance of the original cast of Hamilton. It's like, $1,000? I mean, I, I don't know how good a play has to be before I reach into my checkbook. It's a market. Right? I, Just I the market. Guess. I was in, I was, um, in New York working when Nicholas Nickleby first came in from the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they broke the $100 mark for a play that was eight and a half hours worth of theater, right? I mean, $100 is chump change on the wait line or maybe standing room now, right? Just like, oh. really? you know, when I When I was in school, I went to the, I was in school in Manhattan, and I went to the, the plays all the time, but, you know, $5, two firsts, right? Did you have standing room? I mean, or was they called? So standing room. We yeah. You know, whatever. I mean, it's only recent years that I've been able to get closer to the stage. Right. I like getting close. I like the, the, the smell of the Watch grease paint, sweat. the roar, of the, the smell of the roar of the crowd and the grease paint and all that roar stuff. The, the smell of the grease paint, the roar of the crowd. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or the spit. The smell. No, it's the other way. It's the smell. The smell of the grease. No. The, the smell, smell of the, of the of crowd the and the roar of the grease paint. Roar of the grease whatever. paint. Whatever. <laughs> it was a play. It was years ago. It was a play. Yeah. No, my goodness. So I mean, uh, you know, what about the audience here? You know, I mean. One of the problems, for example, in the Hawaii Opera area, mm -hmm. is that it's hard to it's hard to get young people, millennials and younger, to to dedicate themselves to opera, to spend the money, or to find the money, and to go and spend the time to maybe read up a little, maybe listen to a lecture on, on you know on the outside of the theater beforehand, and put it in a historical context so that they can appreciate it. Um, and I bet the same kind of thing exists, you know, in the in the theater as in the opera. Well, I think. The opera, and we were talking about this earlier, um, I think there's a generation that missed 
the opera that right now, it's interesting because I think HOT is having the same problem that Hawaii Theater was having when the Hawaii Theater was closed and a whole bandwidth of generation of either kids didn't get brought to the theater or parents. And they're now the ones who are taking their children to theater and they don't go to the Hawaii Theater because they weren't taken as children. The people who were parents while the, the theater was closed are now writing philanthropic checks and they don't think of the Hawaii Theater because they didn't go when they right, were, yeah? Right. I think HOT has got um, a bandwidth of, and they're doing a wonderful job. Eric Haynes and his education program, um, they've got that thing called Opera for Everyone. He which, sat in that seat. Did he? Telling us about it, and, oh. and then I asked him to sing, and he just blew everybody up here. He's with got a wonderful booming voice. voice all through the theater. They well, know about it on the, on the whole floor, on the eighth floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a wonderful, wonder. I, have, I produced him. I brought their stuff into the Hawaii Theater when I was there, because I think it's so important to get opera to children, right? I mean, and my little kids from get grades one through eight, I bring them in to watch Eric's and his, his touring opera things come in. Just it's part of what, it's part of theater. Absolutely. For sure. It's an essential, uh, theater is an essential element of opera. I think so, but an opera is, I was watching, I actually had the privilege of being uh, in this recent Tales of Hoffman that was Henry Akena's swan song. Yeah. And, um, it was a magnificent production, and when you opera at its best, it aspires to so much. It aspires to perfection of sound, of voice, of orchestra, of light, of art, of the, it aspires to the best, and when it all comes together, it's almost a religious experience. You know, it was just extraordinary. And when it misses, or when any one of those elements misses, it sucks. It yeah, just yeah. sucks big time. But there's, but, but that's but not what happened. But that's the, the risk and the reward. You, right, you know, right, right. You might see one where it's, it sucks. But on the other hand, to see one it's where good. it's good, that leaves an impression forever. So what HOT does with the final dress rehearsal is to bring, every people already know this probably, but they bring teachers and students from across Oahu. And the kids, um, I, I prefer to see the operas if I'm not going to be in them. I prefer to be, watch it that night because the house is full of these kids who have dressed to the nines yeah. because they're seeing see opera. Them re reacting to it. And they react. And yeah. when something's funny, they laugh. It's a visceral response. Yeah. What was really I watched... Um, um, when they did Midsummer Night's Dream, not not the Mendelssohn, but the um, Britain's opera yeah. that has a countertenor playing Oberon. Okay, and I obviously no one had told the children who were filling that house what a countertenor was. Okay, so I'm back in the nosebleed seats up there, and I'm and whoever played Oberon looked like a transformer toy. I mean, he was built like a superhero, and his costume was to die for. And he steps forward. He'd done some walking around the stage before that, just so people kind of got an eyeful. And then he came forward to sing, and here's this. Ah! He's got this little teeny weeny soprano voice, and there was a gasp in the house. I mean, all these kids were like sitting. Yeah. Yes, they were sitting up to wait to hear what Oberon's going to sing, and he opened his mouth, and out came that. Oh, it was hilarious, but they're never going to forget that. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Do you act now? Yeah. Days? Oh, yeah. yeah. I was. I, I was. Well, I just finished. I did. Um, I did three non-singing roles in uh, HOT's uh, Streetcar Named Desire, the last of which was the nurse that takes Blanche to the ground. And we had Blanche in this chair last week, you know. She's wonderful. She was fabulous. Jill. Yeah. Jill is just... Jill Gardner. Jill Gardner. Oh, my yeah. God. When yeah. I met her, I mean, just a quick side trip, um, I was one of the principals because I had a speaking part, right? So I get to go to the luncheon that kicks everything off, and I met the director first, and I said, well, I just watched the, the movie last night, and the, that nurse took Blanche to the ground. And... <laughs> Are we going to do that? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I went, how much fun? And then I met Jill. I'm like, oh, hi, Jill. And she was a good six to she's, seven or eight inches yeah, taller than me yeah, and yeah. outweighed me by a bit. And I said, oh, do we have a fight choreographer? <laughs> and he said, oh, no, we're going to do this ourselves. I'm going, really? All right. Uh, but Tony Pasquale, bless his heart, came in and just gave us some really safe moves so that she didn't get hurt and I didn't get hurt. And it was fine. And then I did um, Tales of Hoffman as one of the five wicked pieces of smoke that swirled around the villain. And that was really fun. Um, I'm going to be doing this piece I told you about, The Last Days of Judas Iscariot, um, which Mark Branner is directing. And he's got he's got two two ringers coming in who did the production with him before in L.A. And one guy coming, they're playing the two attorneys I was telling you about. And then the guy playing Satan is, a one, is a, an amazing actor coming in from New York, <coughs> Mother Teresa. And I'm co-producing while Mark is in China on another project right now. You know the lines? 
Yes. Well, how about closing here? We have, we're out of time, but how about closing with a line? Let me let me see you project uh, an emotional emote, if you will, on the stage. Bye. One must take responsibility for one's own salvation. When you turn off God, you're saying, I know better than you. No good boy. No good. No good. Excellent. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, Ethan. thank you, Kay. What a pleasure. Wonderful to see you. Oh, thank you. Fun. We have to do this again. We're we're only beginning this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha. Aloha.